So the first thing I want to touch on today, or the first topic is physiology. Okay, how does muscle growth actually occur? Okay, so physiology is analogous to the introduction of a story. If you're reading a book, okay, obviously the introduction tends to come first. Physiology is like the introduction. Okay, you could read the book without the introduction, but you probably wouldn't have a, a grasp of the actual story. You wouldn't really know what the characters are, you know, what they're actually doing. Uh, you wouldn't understand their personalities. And it just makes the story very hard to kind of, you know, wrap your head around. The same kind of a thing plays out here, okay, in the realms of, of fitness. If, you're, if you don't understand physiology at all, if you have no, you know, comprehension of it, well, you can still get some results, okay? You can still build muscle, undoubtedly, but the title of today's presentation is Maximizing Growth. You guys are here for one reason, because you're committed to building muscle. So understanding physiology is, is vital, okay? You need to read the introduction before the actual, you know, main body of the story if you want to be able to comprehend the story as a whole. That's what we're going to be doing here, okay? So essentially, physiology is the how of a system, okay? So how do things actually work, okay? And what we need to understand is that when we, um, you know, assign someone a training program and we manipulate all these variables, you know, we progress their training, we get them to eat in a surplus, we do this, we do that. What we do is we're, we're manipulating things based on what we see on a macroscopic level, okay? So we see the human, okay, we see ourselves and we say, okay, well, what do, we, what do I need to do to, you know, promote muscle growth? Okay, but fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to change what happens within us on a cellular level. Okay, it's what happens to the cells. It's, it's how the cells change on a microscopic level that leads to results that we can actually observably see in the mirror okay, on a macroscopic level. So you need to understand that it all kind of starts on the level of the cell. Okay, and understanding how resistance training interacts with human physiology will simply improve exercise prescription and the effectiveness and safety of the uh, exercise that you're doing, right? So this is the way I like to view it, okay? What we generally do is we generally provide methods to our clients or we follow a method ourselves, okay? If that method is going to be somewhat effective, it needs to be based on principles, okay? Principles will inform how the methods should actually be um, created and developed, right? But then what comes first is physiology, okay? The principles need to be based on physiology if they are going to cause any meaningful effect that we can actually you know, eventually observe, okay? If the principles don't follow physiology, you know, aren't based on the rules of physiology, then the methods just aren't going to have, you know, a, a robust effect. So that's what we're trying to establish in this first uh, section of today's uh, presentation, right? Now, I want to start off with, you know, actually understanding what part of a muscle grows, okay? Because this will have major implications for a few things we speak about later. So essentially, when we think about a muscle, we think about, you know, the whole muscle. So what you're looking at in the first section of that picture there, okay? Think of that as your bicep. But if we dig a little deeper, then we actually see that muscle is a lot more complex than what we may actually seem to think, okay, at first glance. So what actually grows is the myofibrils, okay? So the smallest uh, components of the muscle, as you can see there right at the end, you know, thousands of myofibrils make up your whole muscle and they're the things within the muscle that actually grow. Okay, so once you get enough of those myofibrils to grow, the whole muscle tends to just expand and thus you have a bigger whole muscle. Okay, so the point I want to get across here is that when you do a bicep curl, for example, your whole bicep may be working, but some of those individual myofibrils will be working more than others. Okay, like I said, this has implications for what we speak about later. So I just wanted to lay the foundation there. Now, how does resistance training actually work? So, like I said, if you're doing a bicep curl, what you're doing is you're lifting weights against gravitational force, okay? And what this means is that the target muscle needs to generate its own internal force or intramuscular force to overcome the external load, right? 
So like I said, it needs to be, the internal force needs to be greater than the external force for a repetition to be completed, okay? Now, when you get close to muscular failure, so let's say you're doing a set of bicep curls, okay, and you are doing a 10 rep max, you're getting close to failure. As you get close to failure, fatigue goes up, and thus the force that the muscles need to generate actually increases, okay? Because they're getting fatigued, which means they actually need to work harder to overcome that external load, right? And then eventually they just tap out because they can't you know, give any more, and that's muscular failure, okay? So as you can see there, the external force is a dumbbell, internal force is, being, is happening within the muscle itself, and that internal force we can also term mechanical tension, okay? So generally the terms force and tension can be used interchangeably for our purposes, right? Now, mechanical tension is what actually promotes muscle growth, okay? So it's the tension that the muscles experience when you're lifting weights. And we can break mechanical tension up into two components. So we have the magnitude of that tension, which is dependent on how many muscle fibers are activating. So remember, if we think about that first photo I showed you, if you do a set of, you know, if you, if you get a, a load that could take you a 10 rep to a 10 rep max on a bicep curl, but you only do five reps, the amount of muscle fibers and myofibrils that activate is going to be very low because essentially your body doesn't need all those muscle fibers to only do five reps. Okay, so if we can get full muscle fiber activation, then the magnitude of tension that our muscles experience is going to increase. Okay, and high force generation is also important. And that's what usually happens, like I said, towards the end of a set. Our muscles start experiencing these high internal forces, right? Now, to achieve a high magnitude of mechanical tension, generally the, the key determinant of that will be the intensity of effort that you show in a set. And what that means is how hard you are working within a given set. Okay, and we can measure that by reps in reserve. Okay, so I said earlier, you know, telling someone to do three sets of eight on a bench press to me doesn't really mean much. But if we then prescribe a reps in reserve, okay, so three sets of eight, at a reps and reserve of two, well, now that starts to, to, to build some more meaning. It's got some more meaning behind it because now we know how hard we actually need to, to work within that set. And that will essentially determine the load that needs to be used in that set as well. And we're gonna get to this later. I just wanna briefly uh, scrape the surface here. Um, so just, just quickly as well, to, to get that high magnitude of tension, we need in, uh, lots of motor unit recruitment, which I'm gonna to get to soon. You'll have an understanding of that in a second. And we also need to understand the force velocity relationship. Again, I'll get to that in a second. Now, the second component though, is duration. So we need a high magnitude of tension on our muscles, okay? But we also need to expose them to that tension for a sufficient duration. For example, you know, doing one set to failure on a bicep curl, is going to give you a high magnitude of tension, right? But you're only doing one set. So it's not like your muscles are being exposed to a lot of tension, okay? So thus, you need to do more volume, essentially, okay? And again, I'll touch on that soon. So like it says there, more volume leads to more exposure to a high degree of tension, right? But only if the intensity of effort parameters are met. So you can do more volume. When I say volume, in this case, I'm speaking of more sets. You can do more sets, but if you're not training hard enough, okay, then the magnitude of tension is gonna be quite low. And although you have that duration component, although you're exposing your muscles to some tension, the magnitude is gonna be low and you don't get enough mechanical tension to promote muscle growth, right? So it's really important to wrap your head around this. And there's this hypothesis, which we can term the effective repetitions concept. Um, and essentially what, what this means is that as, or what this concept hypothesizes is that as a set gets close to failure, those final few repetitions are really effective for muscle growth. Okay, so for example, if you're doing a 10 rep max bicep curl set, okay, the last few reps are most likely going to be more effective than the first few. Okay, and that's because towards the end of the set, muscle fiber activation is high and the movement velocity decreases. So what this means, and if you kind of try and conceptualize this yourself, if you're doing a set to failure, the last few reps are a lot slower or should be a lot slower than the first few reps. Okay, thus the movement velocity is decreasing. And this is important. This has major implications. Okay, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second. 
And that's why we term these reps as effective. Okay, so it's important to just understand that. So I mentioned motor unit recruitment earlier when I was speaking about the magnitude of tension. Okay, and what this means, or what this is kind of describing is how muscle fibers become activated. Okay, so what you're looking at there is essentially that plate that you see is like a vertebrae in the spine. We see the nerves branching out of the spine and innovating or activating a bunch of muscle fibers. Okay, on the left, we have low threshold motor units. Okay, that whole thing you see there is called a motor unit. On the right, we have high threshold motor units. Now, the thing is, when you do a 10 rep max set, again, I'm gonna keep using this example. The first five reps on that bicep curl set are going to be highly um, driven by low threshold motor units. Okay, so the, unit, the motor units that innovate type one muscle fibers. So the smaller, slow twitch fibers, right? I hope you guys have somewhat of an understanding of different fiber types, but essentially, uh, the, the first few reps, like I said, it's smaller muscles. It's muscles that can't produce much force that are contributing to the movement because it's easy. First five reps of a 10 rep max set aren't going to be that hard. The, the last five though, or approximately the last five, you know, let's just say as we get close to failure, high threshold motor units start to kick in. So this is where we start getting bigger uh, type two muscle fibers contributing to the movement. Okay, so these muscle fibers are termed fast twitch fibers and they're the ones that can really grow. They have the greatest potential for growth. Okay, so this is why intensity of effort is important. Remember, what I'm referring to there is how hard you're training in a set. If you're taking a set close to failure, you're most likely gonna get high threshold motor unit recruitment and thus big muscle fibers and a lot of muscle fibers are gonna be activated. Okay, you're staying away from failure, too far from failure, you're not gonna get that. Okay, so that's one component to that magnitude of tension, which I spoke about earlier. This is what we need if we're looking to maximize growth. Now, along with that, we also need to understand that as a set gets close to failure, we need those repetitions to slow down. Okay, the speed of repetitions, it has to slow down, right? Like if you're getting close to failure and fatigue is high, then repetitions will slow. If they're not, then you're probably not as close to failure as you think, okay? And what happens when, um, repetition speed slows down is that high forces in the muscles are generated. Okay, that internal force I spoke about earlier, it is really high only when you just can't move the weight very fast. And this is what you see on the graph here. So on the top left, okay, we see velocity on the, the vertical axis. So if you look on the ver vertical axis, you'll see velocity of shortening. Okay, when it's really high, so that red dot there indicates that velocity is high, but force is low because force is on the horizontal axis at the bottom. That means that you're doing fast reps, but the force that is being generated within the muscles is low. Okay, that's what you get at the start of a set. Now, if we look on the other hand, okay, on the right hand side there, we see at the bottom, the red dot at the bottom, that indicates high forces and low velocities. Okay, so if you finish a set, right, if you do a 10 repetition set and your last two reps are just as fast as your first two, well, the forces that are generated within the muscle, unfortunately, aren't enough to promote that sufficient mechanical tension that we need to build muscle, okay? So it's the combination of high forces that you get from these slow repetition speeds and motor unit recruitment, which I spoke about in the previous slide, that leads to a high magnitude of mechanical tension, right? So that's why we need to be um, recording or at least aware of our reps in reserve if we're looking to maximize muscle growth. Okay, if you're just going to the gym and doing three sets of eight and you're not worrying about how hard you're training that set, you're not recording it, you don't have a target, well, three sets of eight, like I said, it doesn't mean anything, okay? You need to have an intensity prescription. So that's why it's quite common that you'll hear of RPE or RIR um, that allows us to stay accountable to our intensity within a set. Very important. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in again. This is Martin from JPS and what you just watched is a snippet from my Maximizing Growth lecture, which is now available online. If you want to know more about the lecture, then click the link below and stay tuned for next week.